series on the Washington Journal. Throughout the month of June, we're going to look at some media moguls, some media business leaders. We're going to start off today with William Randolph Hearst. Next week, we'll be looking at Henry Luce, and further on down the road, William Paley and Ted Turner. But David Nassau is the author of this book, The Chief, uh, The Life of William Randolph Hearst. He joins us from New York City this morning. Good morning, Mr. Nassau. Good morning. Let's start simply. Who was William Randolph Hearst? William Randolph Hearst was the son of a 49er miner who became a millionaire and one of the world, one of the country's first women philanthropists. And he began as a newspaper publisher and by the 30s was the most important media magnate, media mogul in the world. He owned newspapers, magazines, newsreel stations, a movie studio, radio stations, a little radio network, and much, much more. And was he the first American media mogul? I think he's the first, yeah. If media mogul means, if, you know, if we look at what the word means, media is a communications medium. You know, mediums put their hands on the table and communicate to the living from the dead. Well, media is that communications medium. It's that interface between where a message is coming from and the people who are going to get it. And what Hearst did was Hearst understood right away that once he had gathered the news, once he had written his editorials, once he had his opinions, it made no sense to confine it just to newspapers. Why not put that same news and those same opinions on the radio, in newsreels, in magazines? So in moving out from newspapers to these other media, I think it's fair to say he's the first media mogul. What did he own? Gosh. He owned newspapers and major, major newspapers in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Boston, every major city in the United States except Philadelphia. He made a deal early with... Adolph Ox, uh, the New York Times, who wanted to move to Philadelphia. He owned major magazines all over the world, including Cosmopolitan, which was the most important opinion journal. He owned his own newsreel service. He had a radio network. He had his own news service that competed with the AP and the UPI. He had a feature service. He had a couple of syndicate services, and he owned his own movie studio, which was a very cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan studios, which was in the beginning of the 20th century, a major, major producer of motion pictures. One of the pictures you have in your book is of William Randolph Hearst in 1919 greeting the uh, American soldiers coming back. He's standing amidst several politicians. Did politicians fear or... Uh, did they want his endorsement? Did he endorse? This is a very interesting picture. Hearst was opposed to World War I. And when the Americans entered World War I, he sort of tepidly approved, but argued for a peace treaty from the very beginning to the very end. You see here, when it was announced that he was going to greet the soldiers, there was all sorts of hubbub. There were letters, congressional reports, congressional inquiries, all of which said that this man should not be allowed to greet the soldiers. He snuck in there at the last minute, so that picture was taken. Uh, he was feared. He was not loved. He was feared by politicians because he spoke directly to millions and millions of Americans. In the, at the height of his career, in the 20s and the 30s, one out of every five Americans read a Hearst newspaper. The numbers are on the screen. 202 is the area code for all of our numbers. If you want to join our conversation with David Nassau, the author of The Chief, talking about William Randolph Hearst. 585-3880 if you're a Republican, 585-3881 <laughs> for Democrats. 585-3882 for all others, and of course our international line, 585-3883. Mr. Nassau, you said that uh, politicians feared William Randolph Hearst. How did he influence uh, politics and public policy? He was... I got interested in Hearst 
from, from the very beginning because I wanted to write about the media and politics. And the most interesting way to do that was to take a man who was a multimillionaire, who was a media mogul, and who wanted to use and was willing to use all of his power to get himself elected president. Never got himself elected president. Got pretty close. In 1904, he came in second in the balloting for the Democratic, at the Democratic Convention. Never got himself elected president, though he served two terms in Congress. But he set the agenda. When he took up an issue, whether it was the world court, whether it was the income tax, that issue became a major issue. And every politician had to take a stand on that issue. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, you, you mentioned the world court and the income tax issue. What were his positions? He was a West Coast isolationist. What do I mean by that? I mean that he was absolutely opposed to American intervention in or American involvement in the affairs in Europe. He believed that Europe was the old world, Europe was dying, Europe was engaged in this civil war in, that resulted in the Great War and World War II, and that America was the new world it had to keep out. He was not an isolationist, however, when it came to Mexico, to Panama, to South America, to the Philippines, obviously, or to the Pacific. He wanted, he thought, that's where America's interests lay, and that's where we should be putting our energies. He was absolutely opposed to the World Court. He was absolutely opposed to the League of Nations. He was absolutely opposed to the First World War and the Second World War. He did not want American boys to die. He did not want American dollars spent propping up England in a war for supremacy in Europe. You say he was against World War II also. Did that hurt him in readership? He quickly came around. By the time World War II came around, he was a relatively old man. And he had begun to take a withdraw a little bit from, from his newspapers. He was smart enough to know that once war was declared, he was going to be an American, he was going to be a patriot, and he was going to be full square in favor of prosecuting, of prosecuting that war. Uh, but he argued throughout, in World War I and in World War II, for some sort of negotiations. What hurt him, and what hurt him very badly, what nearly bankrupt his empire, and what nearly destroyed him, was when in mid-1930s he took on Franklin Roosevelt. He had gotten Roosevelt elected. He had supported him. And then after the income tax, and after he began to think that Roosevelt was too much of an internationalist, he went after him. And he went after him viciously. Hearst did not believe in neutral journalism. He believed in advocacy journalism. He wrote his own editorials, and he put them on the front page. And he signed them in big, big letters. And then he read those editorials on the radio and talked them on his newsreels. So if you bought a Hearst newspaper, there was no way to escape the editorial stance of that newspaper. And when he went after Roosevelt, he alienated many of the lower middle class, middle class, and working people that made up the bulk of his circulation. He was so violently anti-Roosevelt, anti-New Deal, that his readers had to make a choice, Roosevelt or Hearst. And more often than not, the choice was Roosevelt. His circulation declined, and he got into terrible trouble in 1937, and in effect lost his control of his empire for about five, six years until World War II. First call up for David Nassau, author of The Chief, Madison, Wisconsin, Democrat. Uh, hi, this is so interesting. I think I'm going to try and get that book. He sounds like a fascinating author. <clears throat> I grew up in, with very thoughtful parents who tended to look at both sides of the question, so I'm not sure how much I was affected by Hearst. I just knew he was really, really powerful, and people might have been afraid of him. Well, recently, I'm wondering if you could tell me if there's any truth about this. Um, we saw the movie The Cat's Meow, directed by Peter Bogdanovich, yeah. which is fascinating and wonderful. And I was wondering if there's any truth to that uh, story. No, 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 no. Uh, 
Mr. There Nassau, is, what is the story she's referring there, to? There is absolutely, there is absolutely no truth. There has been the movie director, Thomas Ince, died shortly after being on a Hearst yacht in the early 1920s. Hearst had a yacht out in Hollywood. He had the yacht and he went on wonderful cruises and parties on his yacht. On one of those cruises, there was a large group of people, including Hearst's companion, Marion Davies, Charlie Chaplin, maybe Luella Parsons, Thomas Ince, the film director. Ince was taken off the yacht ill, died soon afterwards. There were rumors at the time that Hearst had somehow shot, mistakenly shot Ince because he wanted to shoot Chaplin because Chaplin was in love with Marion Davies. Believe me, I looked high and low, up and down. I did all the research that one could do to find out if this story was true. There is not a scintilla of evidence that it's true. None. It makes for a great, great story. I haven't seen the movie, but apparently it's an enjoyable movie. But it has, as far as this historian is concerned, absolutely no truth value. Next call, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, actually, my question is about the castle. And um, why exactly was it so luxurious? Was he uh, uh, trying to uh, social stature uh, updo one other person or something? And um, and uh, just real quick, I know that uh, they had a TV special on um, the castle, and it was hosted by his granddaughter, Patty Hearst. And it was once said that there was uh, some artwork that was never seen to the public. I guess it's down in some basement or something that is just unbelievable. It, it would uh, basically outdo the, uh, the all the museums throughout the world, all the artwork he collected. Can you elaborate on that? It's a great, great question. San Simeon is one of the marvels of the, of the world. Hearst didn't much care what other people thought about him, but he wanted to have, the, he wanted to live in splendor, in luxury, and in beauty. And he constructed for himself that monumental uh, castle at San Simeon, which he thought was the most beautiful place on the earth. It's on the central coast of California, halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. It is gorgeous. If anybody has not seen it yet, it is, it is worth a trip. All his life, all his life, from the time he was a child, Hearst collected art. And he collected not simply paintings and little pieces of sculpture, he collected monasteries, took them apart stone by stone from Spain, had them shipped to the United States and put back together again. He collected tapestries. He collected huge, huge fireplaces and mantles uh, and sculptures that weighed in the tons. There was no place to put them all, even at San Simeon. So he had warehouses all over the place in Los Angeles and New York, near San Simeon. The caller is absolutely correct. Those warehouses, especially one in the Bronx, which is still owned by the Hearst Corporation, had all sorts of artworks and art materials. A lot of that was sold off when in 1937, as I talked about before, Hearst nearly went into bankruptcy. His art collection was so huge that the auctioneers and the dealers who were trying to raise cash to keep his empire afloat leased an entire floor of gimbals, fifth floor of gimbals, I believe, in which they began to sell off some of his smaller knickknacks from the castle and that had been stored in his warehouses and never shown to anyone. In your book, you have pictures of four other houses that uh, uh, Mr. Hearst owned. The Castle in Wales, Ocean House, Beacon Towers, and Cinderella House. How, how, uh, tell us about these. Well, uh, let me start. Uh, on the screen, you now see Belmont Towers. Belmont Towers was in Sands Point, Long Island. It was supposedly, and, and I think this may be true, the model for Scott Fitzgerald when he wrote The Great Gatsby. He, Hearst bought this for his wife, Millicent, remodeled it with Millicent, even though he had left Millicent and was living with Marion Davies in California. For Marion Davies, he built Ocean House, a 100-room house 
beach house in Santa Monica, which was on the water and was the scene of some of the most glorious parties in the history of Hollywood and the Hollywood community. He had an estate in the central coast of California, San Simeon. He also bought a 13th century castle in Wales, St. Donat's, where he visited every summer. And this medieval castle was reconstructed with modern plumbing, modern electricity, pools, all the conveniences of home. And Hearst spent two or three weeks there every summer and until World War II. Not finished yet. He also had a, an estate called Wintoon in Northern California near Mount Shasta. And there, instead of building one large castle, as at St. Simeon, as at San Simeon, he had five or six villas. This is one of them. Each one of them was specially constructed. It looked like a little Bavarian village. And he brought in a man named Pagoni, who was one of the great illustrators in Hollywood, to draw murals on the front of each of these. And those murals were half Disney, half Grimm's Brothers fairy tales. And the Cinderella house and the Bear house and the other houses were named after the murals on the front. The Wintoon estate is, is simply glorious. It, he also had a million-acre estate in Babacora in Mexico, uh, which I don't have a picture at, which was appropriated and taken over by the, by the Mexican government in the um, 1950s. Back to calls. Next up for David Nassau, Olympia, Washington. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alan Artis. Uh, I published a small newspaper in Olympia, here. This is the first time I've ever called, and I, I, I want to say I appreciate C-SPAN. This is, I've watched it for years, but this is the first time I've called because I was a, a, a publicist of a small newspaper, and William Randolph Hearst is uh, one of the, uh, my icons, you know. Um, but um, as, as far as Objectivity. Uh, how do you feel um, that William Randolph Hearst dealt with this? Yeah, that's uh, a, as far as is, you know, Republican, Democrat, you know, conservative, uh, uh, liberal. Right. It's a very good question. Very good question. Hearst did not believe in objectivity. He did not believe that it was possible to be objective, and he didn't think it was the job of a newspaper to be objective. He believed that it was his responsibility as a publisher and as a very intelligent man, which he thought he was, to tell the people what he thought, what he believed. And he never even attempted to cover all sides of every question. And he never believed that his readers thought that he was, that was what he was about. Now, we have to remember that he owned a newspaper at a moment in time when every city had multiple newspapers. And the feeling on his part was, if you didn't like what he had to say, buy another newspaper. Or buy his newspaper and another newspaper. When you read his newspaper, you didn't read a Democratic newspaper or a Republican newspaper. You read a Hearst paper. And you were getting the news as Hearst saw it, and editorials and opinion as Hearst wrote them and oversaw them. He was an advocacy journalist, and up until the, the 1930s, newspapers in this country were evenly divided between advocacy journals and between those journals that practiced what the New York Times called objectivity, all the news that was fit to print. In the late 1920s, there is this wonderful piece in the old Vanity Fair called The Clash of the Titans. And it asks, what is the direction that the newspapers are going in? Will it be her style, advocacy, personal journalism that's always exciting, that's bombastic, that's passionate, that's powerful? Or will it be Adolf Ochs 
style journalism that is gray. He was the publisher of the New York Times. That's gray, that's a little boring, uh, that claims to be objective. Well, when Hearst went after Roosevelt, when his opinions were so violently out of the mainstream that he lost circulation, it became clear to newspapers across the country that gray, bland, objective journalism, which didn't alienate a large number of readers, was the way to go. Next call, Pacifica, California. Good morning. Yes, I wanted to tell Brian Lamb that for years I've relied on C-SPAN for the up-to-date news, and I wonder why you're not covering present-day moguls instead of dead ones. And I really miss uh, the old format where we heard more about what's going on in today's world. And I called earlier uh, to talk on the subject of uh, uh, more news, uh, international news, which I'm glad to hear and only hear on PBS and, and, uh, and Brian Lamb's C-SPAN. I'm disappointed that uh, you're going... To, you're trying more to be History Channel 2 than uh, informing us today because we definitely lack uh, media uh, uh, coverage of, of international news and up-to-date news. And did you watch the first two hours of the show this morning? Yes, I did, and okay. I tried dialing okay. through there. Good. And uh, I should tell you we're going to cover more dead journalists this afternoon on American Writers. Walter Lippmann is the focus of this week's American Writers. That'll be at 3 p.m. live from the Metropolitan Club here in Washington. Montague, New Jersey, Republican. Good morning. Yeah, how you doing? Good. My name's John, and uh, thanks for letting me come on. And uh, I'm a Republican and a conservative, and, uh, you know, just watching what you're showing about this Democrat that had huge amounts of money, own big, huge houses that I consider would have probably contributed to the environment. And uh, all I hear about is how Republicans are rich and how they are misers and they're trying to destroy the world. And uh, where I live, there's probably a lot of rich Democrats here. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing. They own big houses. They have it all. And uh, then they put down the Republicans. So... David, I just don't understand. David, Na David Nassau is. Uh, William Randolph Hearst was a Democrat. Would he be a Democrat today? No, absolutely not. William Randolph Hearst was a radical uh, populist Democrat in his youth and then became very much a Republican. He voted for every Republican from Harding to Hoover, turned against Hoover, voted for Roosevelt for one term, 1932, then voted for all the Republicans again. So in the second half of his life, he was very much a Republican. He would have been considered a right-wing Republican, and he would be very much a Republican today. He was violently opposed to the New Deal, to Roosevelt, um, within two years of Roosevelt's election. Was, was he close to any presidents? He, wasn't, he was close enough to be invited to the White House by every president from Grover Cleveland to Roosevelt, except for Wilson, who he hated. I don't think they, uh, I don't think they liked him very much, but they respected his power. And Roosevelt, and he played this dance for years in which Roosevelt would invite him, would give him gifts, would talk about how wonderful he was. The two of them would have a press conference together, and then Roosevelt would privately attack Hearst, and Hearst would publicly attack Roosevelt. Barry Wales, good morning. Ah, yes, good morning. How are you? Good. Uh, I live about 20 miles from St. Donut, uh, and, it's a, and it's a beautiful place. However, what I'd like to know is how do you think uh, Wilma Hearst uh, actually looked at the international scene as a whole, and how do you think he would examine uh, today's modern world compared to uh, that of the 30s? I think he would... It's, it's very difficult. I think he would still be somewhat of an isolationist, very much of an isolationist. Uh, 
I think he believed that it was not America's business to try to police the world, and it was not America's business to attempt to fight terrorism, let us say, all over the world, or communism all over the world. He believed in protecting America and in protecting America's interests, but he was very, very much an American firster. That is his term, really. He invents that term. He uses it, and he felt very strongly about it. Next call for David Nassau, Waterford, New York. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, First-time caller, long-time listener. Thank you for having uh, William Randolph first as a subject. Um, I'm interested in the yellow journalism of his style of newspaper and his relationship with Harry Anslinger and how he got the, uh, the marijuana prohibition started. You know, I wish I knew more about that. I spent a l many, many years on Hearst, and I did an awful lot of, of research on it. A lot of stuff that goes on in, that went on in California, although Hearst took credit for it or was blamed for it or was celebrated for it, it came out of other reporters and editors and publishers who worked for the Hearst papers. So I, unfortunately, was not able to find any direct connection between Hearst himself and the, the marijuana uh, restriction movement. Uh, next call for David Nassau, Columbia, South Carolina, Democrat. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for C-SPAN. I uh, would like to thank you for uh, having uh, Dr. Matthew Bruckley on recently on uh, Book Notes. Uh, he's a preeminent Fitzgerald scholar, and we're very proud to have him here in South Carolina. And he made a great interview. Uh, my question's about Hearst. Uh, two points. Uh, one, how did uh, Hearst uh, relate to the film uh, Citizen Kane? in which he was basically portrayed as a megalomaniac. And uh, kind of following up on uh, the previous caller's question, uh, did he use drugs or alcohol? Uh, thanks very much, and uh, I'll listen to uh, your comments. Let me start with the second question first. He did not use drugs or alcohol. He was, he drank very, very occasionally. But Hearst, and, and a, I don't know how this happened, his father was an alcoholic. His children, I think, drank too much. His the love of his life, Marion Davies, was a terrible alcoholic, and he tried all his life to get her to stop drinking, uh, using every remedy known to, you know, to, to man and woman and some that were, that were not known. But he himself decided when he was in college, and he wrote a letter to his mother, Phoebe Hurst, whose picture is now on camera, and he said, I'm going to stop drinking. And he said that in college, and, and he didn't drink from, from that moment on. Uh, Citizen Kane, great story. By the time Citizen Kane was produced, Hearst was in his late 70s. He had been through it all. He had been called every name in the book, and he didn't care, just did not care. What riled up his supporters and his friends, including Luella Parsons, his gossip columnist, was not necessarily the portrayal of Hearst, but it was the portrayal of all the women around him. Look at Citizen Kane again, a brilliant movie, but one of the most misogynist films ever made. Every woman in it is portrayed as a, you know, as a nightmare, as a monster. And it was this portrayal of the people, the women who were important to Hearst, that got the people around Hearst angry and pushed them to try to destroy the film. Hearst let that happen. But Hearst was much bigger than Orson Welles and didn't, didn't pay much attention to what Orson Welles was doing. Was, uh, how many times was he married? Once. Two? Once. He was married once, never married. This was Millicent Hearst, who was a showgirl when he married her, was an independent, extraordinary woman, a very strong, powerful woman in her own right, who had her own philanthropies in New York, was something of a feminist. Uh, they were separated in 1925. They, were, they remained close to one another. And for the next 35 years of his life, Hearst lived, though did not marry, Mary and Davies. They lived together in California. And he stayed married to Millicent? He stayed married to Millicent, right. 
The reason he didn't divorce was that there was an unwritten law among publishers at that time that you did not talk about the private life of anybody until that private life got into the courts. And Hearst knew full well that should he divorce Millicent to marry Marion Davies, that story, his life story, Marion's life story, Millicent's life story, and the intimate details of their lives together would be on every front page in every newspaper in the country. He did not want that for anybody. He also was worried that because of community property laws in California, he would have to destroy his empire in order to settle with Millicent. Millicent agreed. She was happy to remain Mrs. William Randolph Hearst. They stayed married. They stayed friendly. They stayed in communication. He stayed with Millicent when he visited New York. He helped her design Belmont Towers, bought it for her. They raised their children together. But he lived with Marion Davies in California. Knoxville, Tennessee, Republican. Good morning. Um, Laura Lynch, actually, I live in New Tazewell, north of Knoxville. Um, first of all, I want to commend the uh, C-SPAN people for always providing provocative and intelligent uh, situations like this. Uh, now, this has been knocked around a lot uh, in the public mind. My question is this, sir. You said Mr. Hurst was adamantly against World War I, World War II involvement in Europe. He saw that as the old world. We were off to a fresh start. But you indicated he saw an American hegemony over the Caribbean and into the Pacific, maybe a, a logical conclusion to manifest destiny. To what degree do you think he was actually responsible? And in how much good faith did he act regarding the uh, Spanish War in Cuba in 1898? It's a very, very good question. Hearst, in the, if you read your U.S. history textbooks, Hearst is always mentioned as being responsible in some way for the Cuban-Spanish-American War. Uh, he was, like every other newspaper publisher at the time, with very few exceptions, he strongly, strongly believed that the Americans should intervene in Cuba to get the Spanish out and to win independence for the Cubans. He believed that Europe had no business whatsoever running the affairs of life and of the peoples of this hemisphere, and he wanted them out. So he was strongly in favor of the war. Did he bring about the war by himself? No, he didn't. Uh, he didn't. The newspaper publishers had a lot to say, but the decisions were made in Washington, and they were made for a variety of reasons. The situation in Cuba was a total disaster, a total mess. Cuba was an important trading partner of us. For the sake of the economy, there was no way that we could allow Cuba, that supplied us with a lot of sugar and was a trading partner, to remain in turmoil. Long Beach, New York, on our independent line. Good morning. Uh, good morning, C-SPAN. I see that uh, someone stole my thunder there. But I, uh, he, uh, he's the father of yellow journalism, is that correct? Yes. And I believe that um, he had, uh, like you say, he was motivated uh, in, his, uh, in his mind to uh, bring about um, the war, in, a war against Spain and Cuba. But... Um, did he have any um, any connection or any um, investigation into the Maine, which was the big shout at that in Havana, you know, uh, remember the Maine, another yeah. lie that brought us into a war? Yeah, in the, in the very beginning, Hearst, in his newspaper, published all sorts of... He and, and everybody else, again, he's, he's not alone, he leapt to the conclusion that the Maine had been blown up by the by the Spanish, that a bomb had been attached to it, uh, to its hull underneath. Uh, he made a lot of noise about it, and he was not entirely incorrect, as, as we now think, um, as, as historians now think. He, the, the most important thing about, to remember about Hearst was that he was an extraordinary self-promoter, an extraordinary self-promoter. And when war broke out 
Hearst took credit for it. On the front page of every Hearst paper, there were two ears, they were called. On the top right and the top left, there were little banners. And every day, they said, how do you like the journal's war? The journal was the name of his New York newspaper. So he took credit for the war. He said that he had brought it about, that he was the savior, savior of the Cuban people. And a lot of people began to believe it. I don't think it's true. What was his first newspaper? His first newspaper was the San Francisco Examiner, which he became editor and publisher of because his father owned it. His father retired. His father was almost illiterate and became a senator of the United States. I'm not going to make any comments about the present senators. He was, as a senator in Washington, he needed a journal. He needed a way to communicate with his people back home, first to get himself elected and then to get himself reelected. So he bought a moribund morning newspaper in San Francisco and made it into a slightly less than moribund newspaper and then needed someone he could trust to run it. He gave that newspaper to his 25-year-old son, whose only, only journalistic experience had been the treasurer of the Harvard Lampoon for a year and a half. Everyone thought that there was no conceivable way that Hearst was going to make a go of the San Francisco Examiner at age 25 without any experience. But he did. He made it into the most important newspaper in San Francisco and on the West Coast then moved to New York after about eight years and started up a newspaper there. And who, who owns it now? The San Francisco Examiner has gone through all sorts of changes. Uh, it is now owned independently. The, there were two major newspapers in San Francisco, the Chronicle and the Examiner. The Hearst people bought the Chronicle and sold the Examiner. So the Hearst Corporation today owns the San Francisco Chronicle. Right. The Hearst Corporation today owns the paper that was always the major competitor of the Hearst paper. Washington, D.C. Thanks for holding. Marvelous series. Really interesting. I'm so glad you're doing it. A comment and a question. Um, first of all, I want to suggest that you add a name to your list of moguls who you're covering, uh, namely Rupert Murdoch, who I think is one of the leading figures these days, and there is an author out there, there's a new book called The Murdoch Mission. It's a bit of a hagiography, but I think if we had her on C-SPAN, we could bring her to truth with some good questions. I think it'd be very interesting to, to cover that. And then a question uh, for your guest. Who would you compare hers to in terms of current moguls with regard to this self-promotion and breadth and coverage and reach? And I'll take the answer off the air. Thank you. I, I would agree with you. I, I think the only one to compare him to right now is Murdoch. And the, only, and the reason I would compare him to Murdoch is that Murdoch, like Hearst, has this instinctual grasp of what's next and what's new. And he moves on his own, Murdoch. When Hearst went from newspapers into magazines and from newspapers and magazines into radio and into newsreels, all of his advisors said, you're nuts. You don't do that. You're a newspaper publisher, you don't go in that direction. When Murdoch began to buy satellites for satellite transmission of television programs, everybody also said he was nuts. But he knew where the technology was going. Uh, and in that sense, by moving into new technologies, into new media, he's very much like Hearst was. The difference is that Murdoch understands, I think, from Hearst's failure that in order to keep your business going, it's best to try to hide in the background. One cannot imagine Murdoch writing an editorial and putting it on the front page of the New York Post, for example, in New York or any of his other newspapers, or appearing on Fox News and giving a live editorial. He wants to stay in the background so that his political opinions, personal political opinions, do not get identified wholly in the public mind with his operations.
This is David Nassau's book. It's called The Chief, The Life of William Randolph Hearst. Our next call comes from Narragansett, Rhode Island, Republican. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for taking my phone call. Um, the author is describing uh, Hearst as a, a, a reactionary, as a mm -hmm. self-promoter that has a political agenda. I find it intriguing, and perhaps the author can comment on, um, the use, the employment of uh, Walter Winchell, probably then, um, uh, pre-war uh, and, and uh, during the war, one of the most liberal anti-Nazi um, uh, um, uh, 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 journalists in, in the country. And, uh, and Hearst would just uh, sit back and watch um, uh, Winchell do his thing and uh, roll in the money. Where was his uh, politics then? Yeah, it's a gr another great question. Uh, Hearst fought with Winchell from the beginning. I was able to, in a variety of places, one of, one of the reasons I think that I was able to show how interesting a character Hearst was, was that I had access to all sorts of telegrams and letters and correspondence that nobody else had seen that I was able to, to find and, and be able to use. And in some of those, you see the correspondence between Hearst and Winchell. Winchell had an enormous following as a gossip columnist. And when Winchell began to move into political journalism, Hearst tried to cut him off. And many, many columns did not run because Hearst read them in advance and said, this isn't going to run. There was this ongoing battle between the two of them. And precisely because, as the reader says, Winchell was pro-Roosevelt, he was a new dealer, and he was in favor of intervention, and, and Hearst was not. So they had a long-running battle. Hearst didn't want to fire him, didn't want to muzzle him entirely, because he had this great following on the radio and in the papers, but he did everything he could and to, to move him away from political journalism back to his gossip column again. Next call for David Nassau comes from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I'm not exactly uh, talking about uh, Hearst, but uh, in general, uh, I'm 90 years old, and I remember the Roaring Twenties, the beginning of the Twenties, the Prohibition coming in. That's after the First World War. And uh, I think uh, most of our troubles today was uh, virgin from the from the 20s because everything was moving in, in, in all types of uh, quickness and fantasy and we, we were disregarding our, our uh, religion and uh, not keeping ourselves in order to uh, contain ourselves. Caller, do you, uh, did you read any Hearst newspapers? Well, no, I didn't. No, I really didn't. Uh, but, Were you aware of who William Randolph Hearst was back in the 20s well, and 30s? Yeah, he, he, yeah, he, he was uh, in the paper, but newspaper business, as far as I'm concerned. Randolph Hearst. And and do you recall? Uh, do you do you remember knowing who he was or hearing about him? Well, yeah, I, I heard about him, and uh, I, I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know whether he's. Rep I thought he was Republican, but uh, I, I don't. Uh, don't uh, clarify people, Republican, Democrats, but I think both of them are the same. Okay, thanks and, uh, for your call this morning. And we'll move on to Ocean View, New Jersey, Democrat. Good morning. Yeah, hi, thanks for taking my call. You touched on the, uh, the income tax, and I'm curious where he actually stood on that. And I've also, I've read in the past that uh, the main reason that he, he came out against marijuana was because he had a large uh, investment in pulp mills. I'm wondering if there's any truth to that. Uh, on the marijuana, I, you know, again, I, I just don't know. I wish I was able to, uh, I had been able to find evidence about his relationship to the marijuana movements and the anti-marijuana movement. Well, just David, didn't find it. David Nassau, you write in here that uh, he was the largest uh, property owner in New York City at one time? He was the largest property owner in New York City. He was the largest, he had acres and acres and acres also in, in California near the Grand Canyon all over the world. He was, you know, an incredible, uh, he had tons and tons of money in, in real estate. And did, uh, what were his views on religion going back to the Pawtucket, Rhode Island caller? 
He was not a religious man. He was not a churchgoer. He was respectful of religion, but he was not a man who believed that it was the critical element in sustaining uh, morality. Washington, D.C., Republican. Good morning. Good morning. You're on the air. Yes. Um, I would like to comment um, on, and also um, inquire about the influence that um, William Randolph Hearst had in the Hispanic American uh, War and when the United States was interested in purchasing Cuba or annexating Cuba to, to the mainland. And uh, this didn't work out, but William Randolph Hearst became famous um, preaching to these politicians in Washington and writing uh, in a sensational way about conquering these islands in the Caribbean. And he, his, his, his writings were really uh, um, belligerent and, and uh, to say the least, he was really uh, not a very good um, publisher. He, he, his writings were really um, like Let's, let's get the power, let's, let's get territories, let's go for it. Well, David Nassau, how did he influence Congress? He influenced, it was, he influenced Congress be, by forcing politicians to make decisions and to say what their opinions were. For example, the Spanish-Cuban-American War. When the Spanish and Cubans are fighting and he believes that America should intervene, he sends reporters to the doorsteps of every congressman in a Hearst district. That's in New York, Chicago, California, all over the place. And those reporters camp on the doorsteps until the congressmen come out. And then those reporters say to the congressman, what do you think about this, 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 and this? They get an answer and they publish it in the newspapers. It was impossible to stay on the fence when Hearst wanted to get an answer for you. So get an answer from you. So he, again, set the agenda. He was very much in favor of intervention in America. He was not in favor, necessarily, of annexation of Cuba. The caller is, however, correct only when it comes to, in regard to Mexico. He believed, one, because he owned a lot of land in Mexico, that the Americans should annex Mexico, should make Mexico a protectorate, should have closer control over went on in, in Mexico. And he was influential, I think, in getting the American Congress to pay attention and to exercise whatever influence it could over affairs in Mexico. Were his reporters respected and were they well paid? They were well paid. They were not necessarily respected. They were pests. They were all over the place and they demanded answers to questions that politicians did not want to answer. San Antonio, Texas, good morning. Good morning. How are you gentlemen doing this morning? Good. Uh, I'd like to uh, present a question to the gentleman, uh, Ms. Nassau, in regards to Mr. Hertz and his newspapers, the legacy that he had established that is not being followed by that the papers that bear his name. Uh, for instance, in San Antonio, Mr. Hurst had owned the San Antonio Light News Company, a newspaper. It was two newspapers, and it was San Antonio Express the News, where he bought the San Antonio Express the News and closed out the light, left us with only one newspaper. And on the civil rights issues, the Hearst Newspaper Company has backed away because uh, the reason I say this is because down here I was falsely imprisoned and a federal judge, Judge Session, William Session, barred me from filing any papers in the federal courthouse or took away the right to petition the government for a writ of habeas corpus 
Thank you, caller. Let's get our guest, David Nassau, to comment on the uh, uh, ownership of the different papers around the country. What does the Hearst Corporation currently own? The Hearst Cor Corporation owns newspapers. It has moved out of newspapers. It owns a couple of newspapers. It owns a terrific newspaper in Albany. It owns a newspaper in San Francisco. It owns a couple of other dailies a across the country, but it's moved very heavily. It is the largest owner of magazines across the world and it owns a number of cable stations of media new media companies and of television stations it has a part of a and e it is a part of espn it is a huge player but not in newspapers in the way it once was the hearst during his life never wanted to let go of a newspaper even when they were losing money in 1937, he had to get rid of some newspapers, and after his death in 1951, the company got rid of a lot more newspapers. Burlington, Vermont. Good morning. Um, I'm just calling to say that uh, I think it's kind of hard to even put any, uh, I don't know, I'm just not believing the whole thing of uh, him being any influence. Uh, maybe as an editor, but as a politician back in those days, if you were rich, I think everyone was labeled upper class, and the only way you're going to have influence on anyone is with money, not the position you were in. Uh, I could see myself being, back then, not a rich man, and maybe I had views that were stronger than Mr. Hearst or anyone at that time, and I wouldn't be listened to if I didn't have money. So I think if you had money, maybe that's why you're glorifying Mr. Hearst, not more for his paper or because he was a politician, because they had money back then. It was easily, easy to influence pe people with money because nobody had any. Who are some of his friends and contemporaries? He did not, he was, I don't know how friendly one he was with, with his contemporaries. He wasn't a man who had a lot of friends, but he had a lot of acquaintances. And he was close to Louis B. Mayer, the publisher, the, I'm sorry, the movie producer. He was very friendly with Arthur Brisbane, who worked for him. He was a private man. He was a shy man. He spent a lot of time surrounded by people who he didn't entirely trust because he was so enormously rich and, and so enormously powerful. And you have a picture of him here with uh, Louis B. Mayer. Of course, I can't find it right when I wanted to find it. Um, and uh, Winston Churchill, what, what were the three of them doing together? Churchill visited, one, one of the things that Hearst did, and I wish we had, had had more time to talk about it, was that Hearst wanted, and this follows up on the questions that you were talking about in the two hours before I came on the air. Hearst wanted the American people to know what was going on in Europe, and he thought the best way to do that was to not only report on what was going on in Europe, but to have European statesmen, world statesmen, tell the American people what their positions were on important matters. So Hearst hired, he hired as columnists, Winston Churchill, David Lloyd George, several ministers and prime ministers of France, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. Hitler, Mussolini, and Churchill all worked for him. Churchill visited in 1929, and this was part of, at, during that visit, Hearst took Winston Churchill to the MGM studio for a big luncheon with all the movie stars. And this photograph was taken on the steps of Marion Davies' bungalow. Hearst didn't want Marion Davies to share a dressing room with anyone, so he built her this bungalow that was a mansion in its own right that had a huge formal dining room. And at, in that dining room, there was a luncheon for Churchill. At the end of the luncheon, they came out and the three of them posed together. Uh, Churchill was, at the time, a Hearst columnist. Next call for David Nassau, Essex Junction, Vermont. Good morning. Good morning. Vermont seems to be a small state, but gets on your, on your program quite a bit here. Uh, I have actually two questions to ask. The first one relates to the zoo. I, I'm curious about it, and I wonder if uh, we could hear a little bit uh, about it and, and how it came about and what happened to it. And then secondarily, uh, if this question hasn't been asked, I wonder uh, what he would have thought of the treatment that the Hearst family gave Patty Hearst. I'll uh, hang up and let it go from there. David Nassau. The zoo. Uh, Hearst had the largest private zoo in the world. 
And he had this new for a very, he loved animals. All his life he loved animals. He loved animals so much that he forbid anyone in San Simeon to have mouse traps that hurt the mice. The place was filled with mice. Every night they would, the mice would run all over the place. In the morning they would be caught and put out in live traps, put outside of the castle and they'd come back in. What Hearst wanted very much was a way to entertain his guests his young Hollywood guests that were friends of Marion Davies. So as one of the sites and the attractions at San Simeon, which was, you know, a half day's journey from Hollywood, he erected a zoo. And he had animals from all over the world, an extraordinary collection of animals. Most of them he had to sell off in 1937 when he went bankrupt. <laughs> and he sold them to the San Diego Zoo, got a lot of those animals. At the height of his wealth, how much was he worth? Oh gosh, I, I can't, I, I wouldn't even begin to try to figure it out, nor has anybody else been able to figure it out. Uh, he not only owned all of these newspapers, but he owned mines from his father in, in Peru. He had more real estate than anybody else in New York, except maybe the, the Catholic Church and the, the Queen of England. Uh, millions and millions and millions and millions. Washington, D.C., good morning. Good morning. I'm concerned about the one thing that's always concerned me, the fifth and sixth uh, Buffalo soldiers fought in the, in the Spanish-American War. They helped him in his endeavors, but yet he was a racist. He never did anything to help those people. Now, how can you sit up and talk about how great he is when he's the biggest racist that's ever lived? Was, uh, was William Randolph Hearst a racist? William Randolph Hearst was a racist, but his racism was more towards uh, people of Asian descent. He was violently anti-Chinese and anti-Japanese, as was every other publisher on the West Coast. In terms of uh, people of color, I do not think that it is fair to talk about him in, in quite those the terms that, that the caller has. Uh, in regard to the Japanese, however, uh, I mean, I read many of his commentaries and his editorials about the Japanese and prior to World War II and prior to Pearl Harbor. And every time I read him, I, you know, winced with, with pain that the largest publisher on the West Coast was using these words and these terms to characterize an important segment of the population of California. Last call for David Nassau and William Randolph Hearst, Stafford, Connecticut. Good morning. Yes, I realize I'm the last call. I just want to make real, one real quick comment and one quick question. Um, it's once, uh, once asked uh, who actually attended the castle, and it said that uh, if you walk in Hollywood, you'll know that the uh, people that had visited the castle. But uh, my question was, if Mr. Hearst was opposed to uh, World War II, what kind of influence did he have on Joe Kennedy? Joe Kennedy was also opposed to the uh, World War II. And, and what kind of uh, publishing did he have influenced on uh, the Kennedys coming into power? Thank you. It's a good question. Joe Kennedy was a very close friend of Hearst. Joe Kennedy was his financial advisor in 1937. Kennedy visited Hearst often. John Kennedy got his first job, newspaper job, working for the Hearst Papers. The two of them were very close. They believed together that America should not enter World War II. Hearst reported on Kennedy's uh, speeches. Kennedy visited Hearst, and they conversed together many times on trying to get some unified strategy to keep America out of the war. Just want to our listeners, some of the newspapers that the Hearst Corporation still owns, they include several in Texas, including the Houston Chronicle, the Laredo Morning Times, Midland Reporter, San Antonio Express News, also the Seattle Post Intelligencer, Albany Times Union, and the San Francisco Chronicle. David Nassau is the author of this book, The Chief, The Life of William Randolph Hearst, now out in paperback. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure.
I grew up in, with very thoughtful parents who tended to look at both sides of the question, so I'm not sure how much I was affected by Hearst. I just knew he was really, really powerful, and people might have been afraid of him. Well, recently, I'm wondering if you could tell me if there's any truth about this. Um, we saw the movie The Cat's Meow, directed by Peter Bogdanovich, yep. which is fascinating and wonderful, and I was wondering if there's any truth to that uh, story. No, 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 no. Mr. There Nassau, is, what is the story she's referring there, to? There is absolutely, there is absolutely no truth. There has been the movie director, Thomas Ince, died shortly after being on a Hearst yacht in the early 1920s. Hearst had a yacht out in Hollywood. He had the yacht and he went on wonderful cruises and parties on his yacht. On one of those cruises, there was a large group of people, including Hearst's companion, Marion Davies, Charlie Chaplin, maybe Luella Parsons, Thomas Ince, the film director. Ince was taken off the yacht ill, died soon afterwards. There were rumors at the time that Hearst had somehow shot, mistakenly shot Ince because he wanted to shoot Chaplin because Chaplin was in love with Marion Davies. Believe me, I looked high and low, up and down. I did all the research that one could do to find out if this story was true. There is not a scintilla of evidence that it's true. None. It makes for a great, great story. I haven't seen the movie, but apparently it's an enjoyable movie. But it has, as far as this historian is concerned, absolutely no truth value. Next call, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, actually, my question is about the castle. And um, why exactly was it so luxurious? Was he... Uh, uh, trying to uh, social stature uh, updo one other person or something, and um, and uh, just real quick, I know that uh, they had a TV special on um, the castle, and it was hosted by his granddaughter Patty Hearst. And it was once said that there was uh, some artwork that was never seen to the public. I guess it's down in some basement or something that is just unbelievable. It, it would uh, basically outdo and major magazines all over the world, including Cosmopolitan, which was the most important opinion journal. He owned his own newsreel service. He had a radio network. He had his own news service that competed with the AP and the UPI. He had a feature service. He had a couple of syndicate services. And he owned his own movie studio, which was a very cosmopolitan Cosmopolitan Studios, which was in the beginning of the 20th century, a major, major producer of motion pictures. One of the pictures you have in your book is of William Randolph Hearst in 1919 greeting the uh, American soldiers coming back. He's standing amidst several politicians. Did politicians fear or uh, did they want his endorsement? Did he endorse? This is a very interesting picture. Hearst was opposed to World War I. And when the Americans entered World War I, he sort of tepidly approved, but argued for a peace treaty from the very beginning to the very end. You see here, when it was announced that he was going to greet the soldiers, there was all sorts of hubbub. There were letters, congressional reports, congressional inquiries, all of which said that this man should not be allowed to greet the soldiers. He snuck in there at the last minute so that picture was taken. Uh, he was feared. He was not loved. He was feared by politicians because he spoke directly to millions and millions of Americans. In the, at the height of his career in the 20s and the 30s, one out of every five Americans read a Hearst newspaper. The numbers are on the screen. 202 is the area code for all of our numbers. If you want to join our conversation with David Nassau, the author of The Chief, talking about William Randolph Hearst. 585-3880 if you're a Republican. 585-3881 <laughs> for Democrats. 585-3882 for all others. And of course our international line, 585-3882 series on the Washington Journal. Throughout the month of June, we're going to look at some media moguls, some media business leaders. We're going to start off today with William Randolph Hearst. Next week, we'll be looking at Henry Luce.
and further on down the road, William Paley and Ted Turner. But David Nassau is the author of this book, The Chief. Uh, the Life of William Randolph Hearst. He joins us from New York City this morning. Good morning, Mr. Nassau. Good morning. Let's start simply. Who was William Randolph Hearst? William Randolph Hearst was the son of a 49er miner who became a millionaire and one of the, world, one of the country's first women philanthropists. And he began as a newspaper publisher and by the 30s was the most important media magnate, media mogul in the world. He owned newspapers, magazines, newsreel stations, a movie studio, radio stations, a little radio network, and much, much more. And was he the first American media mogul? I think he's the first, yeah. If media mogul means, if, you know, if we look at what the word means, media is a communications medium, you know, mediums put their hands on the table and communicate to the living from the dead. Well, media is that communications medium. It's that interface between where a message is coming from and the people who are gonna get it. And what Hearst did was Hearst understood right away that once he had gathered the news, once he had written his editorials, once he had his opinions, it made no sense to confine it just to newspapers. Why not? put that same news and those same opinions on the radio, in newsreels, in magazines. So in moving out from newspapers to these other media, I think it's fair to say he's the first media mogul. What did he own? Gosh. He owned newspapers and major, major newspapers in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Boston, every major city in the United States except Philadelphia. He made a deal early with Adolf Ox, uh, the New York Times, who wanted to move to Philadelphia. He owned... 883. Mr. Nassau, you said that uh, politicians feared William Randolph Hearst. How did he influence uh, politics and public policy? He was... I got interested in Hearst from, from the very beginning because I wanted to write about the media and politics. And the most interesting way to do that was to take a man who was a multimillionaire, who was a media mogul, and who wanted to use and was willing to use all of his power to get himself elected president. Never got himself elected president. Got pretty close. In 1904, he came in second in the balloting for the Democratic, at the Democratic Convention. Never got himself elected president, though he served two terms in Congress. But he set the agenda. When he took up an issue, whether it was the world court, whether it was the income tax, that issue became a major issue, and every politician had to take a stand on that issue. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, you, you mentioned the world court and the income tax issue. What were his positions? He was a West Coast isolationist. What do I mean by that? I mean that he was absolutely opposed to American intervention in or American involvement in the affairs in Europe. He believed that Europe was the old world, Europe was dying, Europe was engaged in this civil war in, that resulted in the Great War in World War II, and that America was the new world it had to keep out. He was not an isolationist, however, when it came to Mexico to Panama, to South America, to the Philippines, obviously, or to the Pacific. He wanted, he thought that's where America's interests lay, and that's where we should be putting our energies. He was absolutely opposed to the World Court. He was absolutely opposed to the League of Nations. He was absolutely opposed to the First World War and the Second World War. He did not want American boys to die. He did not want American dollars spent propping up England in a war for supremacy in Europe. You say he was against World War II also. Did that hurt him in readership? He quickly came around. By the time World War II came around, he was a relatively old man and he had begun to take a little, withdraw a little bit from, from his newspapers. He was smart enough to know that once war was declared, 
he was going to be an American, he was going to be a patriot, and he was going to be full square in favor of prosecuting, of perse prosecuting that war. Uh, but he argued throughout in World War I and in World War II for some sort of negotiations. What hurt him, and what hurt him very badly, what nearly bankrupt his empire and what nearly destroyed him was when in mid-1930s he took on Franklin Roosevelt. He had gotten Roosevelt elected. He had supported him. And then after the income tax and after he began to think that Roosevelt was too much of an internationalist, he went after him. And he went after him viciously. Hearst did not believe in neutral journalism. He believed in advocacy journalism. He wrote his own editorials and he put them on the front page and he signed them in big, big letters. And then he read those editorials on the radio and talked them on his newsreels. So if you bought a Hearst newspaper, there was no way to escape the editorial stance of that newspaper. And when he went after Roosevelt, he alienated many of the lower middle class, middle class, and working people that made up the bulk of his circulation. He was so violently anti-Roosevelt, anti-New Deal, that his readers had to make a choice, Roosevelt or Hearst. And more often than not, the choice was Roosevelt. His circulation declined, and he got into terrible trouble in 1937, and in effect lost his control of his empire for about five, six years until World War II. First call up for David Nassau, author of The Chief, Madison, Wisconsin, Democrat. Uh, hi, this is so interesting. I think I'm going to try and get that book. He sounds like a fascinating author. 